How many's got your Bibles? Let me see those. Hold them up. Well done. Electronic Bibles, can I see those, please? Hold those high. Well done. Well done. DC Talk was a group that I enjoyed listening to in the, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, how many knows who DC Talk is? How many used to listen to them? How many still listens to them? <laughs> Same ones. Okay. So um, there was one particular song where they were kind of goofing off, and at the tail end of it says, why can't we be friends? Why can't? How many knows what I'm talking about? So as I'm preparing this message, I'm hearing that phrase from DC Talk in the back of my head saying, why can't we be friends? And so I want to talk today about the mark of true friendship. And you guys were going to let me because I totally forgot. If you got your gifts, make those ready. If I hadn't seen the buckets, I'd have done, passed all over it. How many would just be honest and say, there's some people in your life that you think love you and you think have your back, but you've been questioning here lately. Just hold it up. Wow. I'm on target today. Good deal. Hallelujah. Father, we celebrate your goodness in our life. We thank you today, Lord, for health, wholeness, wellness, life. We thank you today, Lord, that you have already stepped into our future and arranging things for our arrival. I celebrate today, God, that just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So I thank you that your hand is at work, your provision is at work, your protection is at work. So we honor you, we celebrate you, and it's our honor today to participate in the covenant of tithe. So, Lord, we release the tithe, seed above and beyond, Lord, that will bring about fruit in our own lives. But, God, we celebrate today that you're taking this and making the kingdom larger because of it. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. I throw buckets. You going to get it for me? Thanks, buddy. Good job. Say, why do you throw buckets? It's fun. It's fun. I'm going to start with an illustration. I'm going to put a little wind on me. When you get 100 plus people in here, it does get warm, even with the mini splits. Um, so we did, that's why when you guys come in, some of y'all say, it's so cold in here. Just give it a minute. Uh, uh, for those that are new, I understand from AC guys that, have you ever just put your hand in front of your mouth and just blew on it? Just, oh, it's hot. So you got 100 plus people that are singing and worshiping God. That's, that's 100 plus people that are acting like blow dryers in the sanctuary. I'm serious. It's a lot of heat. And so the ACs really do struggle uh, to, to bring that down when there's many people uh, as what we have. So uh, we're, we're, we will adjust that. If I got to do more mini splits, I will do it. Uh, whatever we got to do to make this right and comfortable for you, uh, we're going to make that happen. Let me start with a, with a short story. Ted was a Polish, was born rather to Polish parents in Chicago in 1942. His father was a sausage maker and times were tough. So when Ted was only six months old, he was hospitalized with a very severe allergic reaction to medication. And during that time, he was neither hugged nor held. It was the doctor's orders. And so when he came home from the hospital, his parents described him as withdrawn and listless. During his early childhood, Ted continued to withdraw. But he was very bright intellectually. He sprinted through Evergreen Park High School, and when he was only 16 years old, he headed off to Harvard. 16-year-old going to Harvard. The dude was smart. At Harvard, he shared a, a preppy suite with five other guys. One of his roommates, Michael Rohr, said, quote, I can't remember having a conversation with him, end quote. Patrick McIntosh, another of the roommates, said, quote, Ted had a special talent of avoiding relationships by moving quickly past groups of people and slamming the door behind him, end quote. By the time he was 20 years old, Ted finished his degree at Harvard and headed off to the University of Michigan where he received his master's and Ph.D. And then he went to the University of California, Berkeley, to teach. 
Ted intensified his slide into isolation when in 1971 he moved to Montana and became a recluse. In 1990, Ted's father committed suicide, and Ted didn't even attend the funeral. He said that he had developed a a heart arrhythmia which got worse by dealing with family. So Ted had told the family to draw a red line under the postage stamp to identify important and urgent letters that they might send. And when they used the red line to identify the letter telling of his father's suicide, Ted wrote back complaining that the message did not merit a red line. Ted Kizikski, that's all I'm going to give you, (laughs) continued to go deeper and deeper into seclusion until finally he was exposed as the infamous Unabomber. It's hard to say what caused Ted to withdraw the way that he did. Maybe it was his early illness to which he had the adverse medication reaction. Maybe it was the fact that he wasn't held or hugged as a child. Maybe the fear of people kept him from discovering the joy and the value of friendships. Maybe he reacted badly to some relationships that didn't pan out. And maybe he just got his priorities all wrong and he put relationship building too far down on the list. One thing is undeniable. The end result of Ted's withdrawal was destructive for him as well as many others. In 1998, he was sentenced to eight consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. In June 2023, Ted died by suicide in prison say, wow, Joel, you're off to a great start today. I I want you to notice something. His dad had committed suicide. You remember that? His dad had committed suicide, and while it took a long time, he was in his 80s when Ted committed suicide. So even though it took a long time, that spirit stayed in the family. And though it took longer to get a hold of Ted than it did his dad, in the end, he still got him. So for those that say generational curses are not real, I beg to differ. If you can believe that there are blessings that are passed down from generation to generation, you have to know that there are also curses that are passed down from generation to generation. It's not one-sided. So we live in a paradoxical society. On the one hand, we see adva- uh, ter- crazy advancements in communication technology. And that's denoted by many of you right now on smartphones, right? Right? And now with satellites, we can talk to people across the world, just like they were sitting here in the room with us. There's all kinds of channels of communication that have opened up between people that before were impossible. Did you catch that? Previously, it was impossible. Some of you are sitting here right now thinking that your situation is impossible. Why? Because nobody has ever done what needs to be done in your life to make the impossible possible. I forget the guy's name. Was it Jim Thorpe that that was going to run the race and his shoes were stolen? So he went to the trash can and he found a right shoe and a left shoe, different brands, different everything, but he put them on so he could compete. And watch this. At that time, he broke the world record. Listen to that. So it ain't about the shoes. I mean, when I was a kid, I had, I had shoes that were called, I think they were called Zips. Anybody old enough to remember Zips? Huh? And they had these little, these little knobs on the bottom that I thought were so cool. So I told all my friends, if I'm running and a rock hits one of those things, it's like turbo. <laughs> huh? I don't think that that Jim Thorpe had turbo, but he did what previously had been said is impossible. No man can break the, what was it, a three or four minute mile, and he did. 
So some of you right now are a little distraught because you're convinced that the situation that you're in, there is no answer because nobody has made that answer yet for you. And it could be that God has designed you to be the first to break that barrier. So if you allow the fact that nobody else has ever done it to prevent you from attempting it, then you also will never break that barrier. And watch this. There will be many people that follow you and say, well, because so-and-so wasn't able to do it, I guess I won't be either. Some of you said that about yourself. Well, I'll never, I'll never have a, a, six, a six-figure income because mom and dad never had it. I'll never be able to drive a new car because your grandparents didn't have it. I'll never be able to live in a... Huh? Because you're limiting yourself by what other people did or did not do. And I need you to know that God has called every person to the sound of my voice to be a pioneer. You really are. Some of it might be natural inventions. Some of it might be spiritual territory. For those of you going, boy, these kids are sure are loud. We came from restaurants. These babies ain't got nothing on these waitresses, you know, jingle jangling the coffee. You need some more coffee, sweetie? So that does, I just want you to know that doesn't bother me, so don't let it bother you, okay? So God has called every person inside the of my voice to be a pioneer. And you've got to see yourself that way because if you just see yourself as one of the numbers, just one of the masses, just one of, then you cease to do and be and excel in what God has dictated or called you to do. Some good lungs when she can compete with me with a microphone, I'm telling you. A Harvard professor by the name of Robert Putnam spearheaded a survey of 40 communities around the United States. And I'm going to use this term social capital, okay? The social capital community benchmark survey interviewed 29,200 people by phone. And the result that they came away with was it determined that the degree to which we socialize one with another, trust one another, join in community, It predicts a city's quality of life far better than the levels of education, crime, and income. How well they connect with others, how well they trust other people. So the research found that membership in all group activities, bowling leagues, fraternal orders, churches, labor unions, clubs, all of that has steadily fallen. So as a whole in the United States, our social capital, trust and cooperation with other people, has been in steep decline. What does this produce? It produces loneliness. How many would just admit, you don't have to say that you are, but you know somebody that's close to you that finds themselves continually and habitually lonely? Hold it up. Hold it high. Hold it high. Hold it high. People are feeling so lonely that they're, they're living vicariously through other people's relationships. You know, I tell people, they'll, they'll come and say, listen, I ain't going to be here for the next couple of weeks. Well, why not? Well, I'm tracking across the United States. I'm going hiking. I'm going fishing. I'm going skiing. I'm going this. I'm going that. And I say, well, listen, take lots of photos and videos because I'm going to live vicariously. What does that mean? That means I'm going to enjoy myself by fantasizing that I'm there through your videos and photos. And there are people, this is hard for some of you to understand, there are people sitting in this room right now that are fixated on one, two, maybe three people that they say to themselves, I'd like to live like them. I'd like to have friends like they have friends. I'd like to have the income that they have. I'd like to have people asking me after church, why are you leaving so fast? Where are you going? You going to go eat with us or not? What you, I, I would love, I see that happen to other people, and I just walk by dejected because nobody's asking me. You think that doesn't happen? I, we're, we're pretty good about grabbing stragglers, but that happens as a general rule because other people are having to live vicariously through you because they don't have what you have. Guys, that happens spiritually too. I see people getting blessed and healed and mended and restored and the relationships put back together and depression, grief, sadness, and sorrow coming off of them and suicidal thoughts and tendencies and actions are removed from their life and healings and manifest. All this stuff is going on and they sit back and go, man, 
I wish God loved me like that. So what they do is they just pretend for a moment that it's them standing here. Oh, yeah, I'm going to say that too, Lord. You want to know the difference many times between the healed and the non-healed? Getting up and going to where Jesus is. Oh, we expect that we can get on the Holy Ghost Amazon and order our healing to be delivered to our door within 24 hours. And God is saying, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. He's wanting us to come to Jesus. And most people in America want Jesus to come to them. He already did. It looked like this. There's strong forces behind loneliness and people in America. How many of you enjoyed watching Seinfeld? Hold it up, you bashful people. I know better. Seinfeld. How many knows who I mean when I say Kramer? Ah, you watch Seinfeld. Okay. How many of you like watching Friends? People are feeling so lonely that even watching a sitcom gives them the euphoria of living through somebody else on a TV. Maybe the greatest opportunity we have for evangelism today in the 21st century revolves around the pain that people are experiencing. And a lot of the pain comes from emotional isolation. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? By the love you have one for another. Come here, Chris. You show up at church, you go, Hey, hey, how you doing, man? Love you. That ain't love. That may be the words of love. That ain't love. Love is, hey, man, where you been? How, how come I ain't been seeing you? Why ain't you calling me? We ain't done lunch in about, I don't know, two, three months. What's up with that? I mean, what, you come into church, you sit like a lump on the law. What's up with that? Love says things, watch this, that other people who don't have a love walk with him can't say. I'm going to be real honest. If he stank real bad, you don't know him. He don't know you. And you walk up, it's like, bruh, man, man, come on, man. Right? There, there, I, I see a conflict in your future. But if you have a love walk with Chris, which, by the way, he smells glorious, okay? If you have a love walk with Chris, and you walk up and you catch a whip and say, uh, man, I got something in my car you probably need. Come on. He's going to take it. Why? Because he knows you have his best interest at heart. Oh, yeah. See, y'all going to treat that like it's a little point. It's, it's a little sentence, but it's huge. The reason most people don't trust what other people got to say is they don't believe that their motives are pure and that they have their best interest at heart. Thank you, Chris. But you can take it to the bank that anything that's in this book has your best interest at heart. Everything in here is to love you, encourage you, strengthen you, discipline you, cut out what's bad, and to pour in what's good. So how in the world are you going to have relationships that are healthy? To begin with, you've got to search for it. See, I just, I hear, I've heard this so many years. I've been going to that church for six months. Ain't nobody called me. Ain't nobody talked to me. Ain't nobody invite me. Ain't nobody tell me I look good, smell good, talk good. Nobody. Really? You know, the scripture says if you want friends, you must first show yourself friendly. People don't like to talk about that one. They want to talk about what they didn't get. You didn't get because you didn't give. Try going and getting some dividends on an investment you didn't make. Try that. 
Try going to the try going to the bank and making a withdrawal on an account that you never made a deposit. And people do that constantly in life. Guys, I I love Jesus and I, I can be spiritual with the best of them, right? But there's some practical stuff. The spiritual stuff is no good to any of us if we don't have some practical application. I wonder of the people that knew you if I took a private inventory and you couldn't see the names. I wonder how many people would say of you what you thought of yourself. Relationships have to be properly valued and looked for. You know, you can get an appraiser to give you a value of a piece of property. You can go to the Internet and find values of vehicles. I've been doing a lot of that here lately. You can, you can check stock values because they're constantly monitored. But where is the relationship portfolio? Where is the one that has the list of friends and acquaintances and relationships that you have, and then next to it, a diagram or a graph that shows how intense, how loving, how trustworthy, how solid a foundation that relationship has? In the business world, there's a phrase that says, what gets measured gets done. How many have ever heard that before? How many have never heard that before? Oh, wow. What gets measured gets done. So that's why we measure financial increases. That's why we measure educational accomplishments. That's why we measure job success. That's why we, that's why we need a way to measure our social capital. So when I think about the Unabomber, I have to conclude that his investment in relationships was warped. He was high. He was an intellectual marvel. He was a mathematician extraordinaire. So his brain worked, but he was stunted socially. I'm going to ask a question. Some of y'all are going to think I'm asking something I'm not. Are the relationships in your life getting the priority they deserve? Are the relationships in your life getting the priority that they deserve? You know, the principle of sowing and reaping still applies here. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. You, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. That's not just a financial thing, that's a social thing. So what kind of friends do you want to have? Let me hear from you. What kind of friends do you want to have? I know you know how to talk because I have to kick you out after church because y'all just stay and visit. Come on. What kind of friends? True friends? What is, what's a true friend? Honest? Loyal? Friendly? Dependable? I heard honest. Sol what's solid mean? You mean buff solid or what? Huh? Accountable. We'll use accountable. Avail. <laughs> oh, that's rich. That's rich. Available. Yes. Yes. Like minded and. Whoo. Come on. I'm, I'm going to get some for that one right there. She did that one right. I'll tell you right there. Like minded in Jesus. What'd you have? Huh? Selfless. Doesn't all this sound right? What you got? Yes. You got to love God. Teach them young. That's a great answer. So watch this. A lady in her 30s approached a pastor. Said, Pastor, I want you to pray with me that God's going to give me a husband. And I have some very high standards. And these are high standards that, that I'm trusted and believing God for. So she went on to tell how his looks ought to be. Now, she didn't say it exactly like this, but got to look like Brad Pitt. He's got to be very spiritual. He's got to have the spirituality of Billy Graham. He's got to have a great education, hard worker, considerate, loyal. He's got to dote on me. And the pastor thought to himself, lady, you ain't none of them things. 
how in the world am I going to have a prayer of faith for this? Would a just God do such a thing to a poor guy? See, if we expect God to give us quality relationships, then we need to begin by discovering what it's going to take to be a quality relationship. So how can you be that kind of friend? Number one, who's taking notes today? Who's not taking notes today? Get them, Jesus, get them. Number one, get to know the ultimate friend, Jesus. That's not a cop-out. That's not a... That's not a, a swing and a miss. Get to know the ultimate friend, Jesus. Now, Pastor Bob Schaefer is a great blessing in my life. And as long back as I can remember, over 30 years that he's been in my life, it is not uncommon for him to say, hey, son, I'm coming to town. I'm going to buy you lunch. He's 85 years old and still does that. Hey, son, I'm coming to town. Where do you want to eat? Did you want to you want to say something? You want to give me that? She don't even know what to do. So, at eighty five years of age, he's still doing that. Relationship is something that I glean from those that I'm hanging with. Now I know that you guys idolize the relationship I have with Rachel because we're just so perfect and full of love and no problems whatsoever, but. When, when things get a little bit rocky and she says, hey, why don't you go ride your motorcycle really fast in the rain without a helmet? That's her way of saying I love you but leave. And so if I ever come to her and I say, listen, Pastor Bob has called me for, yes, yes, go, 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 go now, go right now. And that's not just to get rid of me, although that's part of it. She knows that when I come back from hanging out with him, I'm a little softer, a little kinder. My words have shifted. Why? Because you can't hang out with somebody who is that way and it not rub off on you. You hear what I'm saying? So that, that's why you got to level up in your relationships. you got to level up in your relationships. You need to be hanging with people that carry something to a degree that you would like to carry something. If you want to know about business, hang out with somebody who's not just got their LLC. Hang out with somebody who's successful in business. You want a a great marriage relationship? Hang out with people that got a great relationship. It's going to cost you. You have to call them up and say, hey, my wife and I might take you guys to lunch. How about we just schedule, I don't know, once a week for the next 12 months and see what happens? You think I'm playing... Because it has to be consistent. you got to hang out. It's amazing how many people come to me and they expect that I'm going to have words of wisdom from God Almighty in an instant that's just going to solve their issues just, just real fast. Sometimes it happens. But as a general rule, many times what happens is as they're talking, the Lord will highlight stuff. You guys use highlighters? And whenever you find a point that you want to highlight, that you want to remember and go back to, you highlight that. So in my spirit, they'll say something, and the Lord will highlight it. You're going to come back and address that one. Then they say something a little bit like, highlight that one. Say, you're going to go back and, and, and discuss that. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth. How is it that the people that want relationship the most talk the least? I just ain't got no friends. Well, how many people you got in your roller decks? Three. One of the greatest trainings for ministry that I ever had, my first job was C.R. Anthony's. How many of you ever heard or knows or used to shop? Who shopped at C.R. Anthony's? Y'all are old. I'm just telling you, you're old. And I was, I was the school class nerd. Okay? I walked around looking at the floor. I knew who I was around by their shoes. I had a hard time looking at people. Y'all think I'm making stuff up. I'm not. And when I got that job, part of the requirements were you have to greet everybody that comes in the door. And I said, (laughs) sure do you jest. (laughs) I don't know them people. 
Then you fast forward some years when I was in college, and I realized that I had a deficiency in being able to address people and talk to people. So I put myself in environments that forced me to have to do it. And that's where I've told you before, I used to go to Pizza Hut for lunch when I was going to college. And we'd take the buffet, because, I mean, the Bible says that you're supposed to buffet your bodies. And so... As we've gathered around the lunch table, I'd say, whose time is it to pray? And they said, it's yours. Okay, so I stood up on the chair and then up on the table, and I said, let's pray. And about half the restaurant would go. Father, thank you for this food, my friends, and all the people in this restaurant that need your loving. Bless them, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. And sometimes the restaurant would be going. <laughs> but that was something that I put myself in because I needed to break where I was at. And my suggestion you go out to eat today at, after church and stand on your table, I'm not necessarily suggesting that. But I'm saying you're going to have to do something that breaks the cycle that you're in. That's not on other people to do for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. How many is old enough to remember the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? There's some real truth in the phrases of that song. And I want to I tell everybody here, some of you might be here because you were compelled by others to be here. Some of you might be here because you have a, an appearance that you want to keep up. Some of you might have just rolled the dice, at, you know, and just, you just kind of played Russian roulette on Google to find out where you're going to go today. Some of you might have had a friend that said they bribed you and said, listen, I'll buy your lunch if you show up. I don't know what it took to get you here today, but what I am here today to tell you is it's not by accident. What you think might have been coincidence and happenstance or just a weird way that things work, God orchestrated it. And the real issue is not for you to meet me, though that's a privilege all by itself. The real issue is so that you'll open your heart just a little bit more to Jesus. There's something powerful when you're driving down the street and you're looking for a restaurant to go to. When you guys are hungry and you're looking for a restaurant, do you look for the one that has the emptiest parking lot? No. Why? Because that's a sign that other people might have already been there and decided they didn't want to go back. So what you do is you look for restaurants where the parking lot is packed, right? And so there's something powerful when other people are successfully navigating where you want to be. It gives you confidence to do it too. And that's why there has to be people in this house and all over the world that will demonstrate their love for Jesus by allowing their life to be on display. We got so many people trying to hide, so don't look at me. I'm just, just, you know, leave, just stay back. And we need people that are just willing to say, listen, I'm not ashamed of him. And I'm broken and I messed up, but I'm less broken messed up today than I was yesterday because Jesus is doing work in my life. So I don't wait until I get it all worked out. Listen, the moment that Rachel slipped this ring, well, it wasn't this particular ring, but a ring on my finger when we said I do, I've kept a ring on this finger ever since then. Now watch. I was a novice at marriage when we got married. I was 100% married. But for the next number of years, I was going to 100% do it wrong. You hear what I'm saying? But I never took the ring off and said, well, I just want to get my marriage perfect before I advertise that I am. Got a lot of people saying, well, when my walk with Jesus gets to be, you know, like this, then, then I'll go ahead and let people know that, no, it don't work that way. You, you got to wear him now. You got to let him wear you now. Because people need to see that there are Christians that are just starting and veterans that have been there for a long time. Now, I'm going to say this. Just because you're a veteran being saved don't mean you grew. You just went from a six-pound baby to a 600-pound baby. 
Now, come on. Still got to be changed, burped. Play. Look at the keys. Don't get upset. Just a smile. That's why there's so much entertainment in churches today because we've never learned how to actually take the Word of God and go, man, I need that. We come to church. Oh, pastor, can, can I have a drop, please? And there are people that will do that. I'm like, you got to be out your mind. We've got to grow. Secondly, we've got to reconcile with ourselves. Some of y'all are so bent out of shape that you haven't reconciled with a friend or a loved one. You haven't even learned or been told you've got to reconcile with yourself. We need to find a way to receive ourselves. How do we do that? First, we've got to get quiet and still enough to hear what's going on on the inside. I am not saying what I'm about to say because of anything that has happened since we've been here today, okay? Nothing. Zero. But I have noticed that when people feel the presence of God, and though it's a good feeling, it's uncomfortable. All of a sudden, they got to go to the bathroom when they didn't have to go to the bathroom. They got to go outside when they didn't have to go outside. They got to go to. The, they got to go get a drink when they didn't need a drink. They got to go get coffee when it's two, 110 degrees in here and it's the one coffee. They're, they're, we find ourselves looking for an escape because I'm uncomfortable. Y'all catch anything I'm saying? We have to learn how to be okay with what's on the inside. I guarantee you, not one of you decide you're going to come to church today without going to the mirror. And <laughs> Everybody, check, do I got wrinkles in my shirt? Is this the pants I got stains on? Do I got holes in my sock? Right? You check because you want to, watch this, you want to look presentable. If we spend as much time on our walk with the Lord and becoming the kind of friend that we wanted others to be to us, we would attract the very thing that we desire. We just came through the 4th of July. How many of you have animals at home? I'm not talking about your spouse or your kids. You got animal, you have animals at home. Okay. And most of the time animals don't do well with the noise of fireworks. So Fifi, she's an old girl now. She don't hear so good. So it's not a big deal anymore. But used to, she'd hear the outside. And she'd find her way underneath our bed, shivering and and for, you know, till quite some time after they stopped. So we learned a trick back then. We'd turn on the radio, find some Christian music, and we'd just crank that in the house. So there's all this noise. She's not hearing outside because all she's hearing inside is, I love you, Lord. Right? So we come home. She's not freaked out. She's not scared. She's not anything because she didn't hear it because she was preoccupied with this other noise. Watch this. Do that in reverse. Some of you have the 4th of July going on in your head. And you can't hear the Lord saying, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. We can't hear other people saying, listen, I'd just like to hang out with you a little bit, just kind of get to know you. We can't hear that because all we're hearing on the inside is. It's like we have PTSD everywhere we go. You know how many times I've ministered to people, and I can tell, you, you know the look. They're looking at you, but ain't nobody home. You know, their mind is someplace else. You know, they're being polite in every, every 30 seconds. But you know they ain't getting it. And so I'll ask them, i say, listen, what's happening in your head? Huh? What's happening in your head? You know, if I'm being really honest, it's, just, it's like a bunch of white noise. I, 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 my, my, my thoughts are erratic. They're just bouncing everywhere. And that's when I say, okay, 
I just want to demonstrate peace to you. I want to demonstrate peace to you. So I look them right in the eye. I speak to the, to the garbage that's going on in their head, and I command it to stop. And the look on their face is like, wow. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, very clearly. Why? Because I demonstrated peace. Once they had peace in their mind, they could now hear the good news. See, some of y'all got this rejection mentality. I've been trying to tell people about Jesus, and every time I tell people about Jesus, they don't even acknowledge me. They walk off. It's like, that, it's like they never heard me. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't know how to process it. They didn't know how to receive it. They didn't know how to absorb it because all they were hearing was <laughs> Right? So we've got, to, we've got to learn how to do things just a little bit differently. We've got to demonstrate peace in such a way that people will hang around us just to have it. Oh. Say, have you noticed that when you go to a restaurant, the, this, this certain person or persons, they, they tend to try to get close to you? It don't matter where you're at. You can be standing in line at a restaurant, they're right behind Chris. Chris goes to the other side of the restaurant, sits down. They go find a spot right next to him or a table. Right. Why? Because they found that if I'm in proximity, I feel so much better. I don't understand it. But if I'm in his gravitational pull, what is that? That's the anointing of God demonstrating peace. And when you get close to peace, then the peace takes over and the noise goes down. You get away from it, the noise comes up, and the peace goes down until they understand that you can receive peace from him, take it for yourself, and now you can demonstrate that and release it to other. You catch anything I'm saying? I wish people understood that they could catch Jesus as much as they can catch COVID. <laughs> I may have to coin that one. I kind of like that. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. You are mine. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You are accepted in the beloved. You know how many people have a hard time hearing that? You're mine. I love you with a love that doesn't quit. I will always accept you. People are like, oh, I mean, that sounds good. Why? Because their head and their heart are in conflict. You know how many times I got to tell people, look them square in the face and tell them, I really do love you. And most of the time I get, okay. Look at me. I really do. Okay. People have a hard time receiving the very thing they say they want. It's the truth. Many times it's because we feel unworthy. I don't deserve that. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I did on the way here. So we wind up carrying things. So when we hear something that sounds good, we doubt whether or not we heard it correctly because there's so much noise going off in our hearts. We've got to learn to take the journey. Hear the call to deal with pain that we've avoided our whole life. Hear the call to confess and be healed. Hear the call to let, let the blood of Jesus do a deep cleaning of our conscience. A man named Thomas Sowell said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. One more time. When you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. So when you have somebody who's dirty, nasty, stanky, they've been working out in the yard, I mean, their hair's all matted. They got, they got uh, bugs, you know, bug guts from riding a zero turn at 30 miles an hour. 
Um, you know, they're just, uh, their clothes are sticking to them. They know they probably don't smell the best, but they're so exhausted that they can't drag themselves into the shower to get cleaned up. And so they're hungry. It's time to eat. And so you say, hey, let's go grab something to eat. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't feel like it, but I know I need to, so let's go. So they stand up, they go, go get in the car. Their hair's all lopsided from wearing the hat. They got sweat stains in the pits and around the shirt. It's still wet, ringing with sweat. Um, they forgot deodorant that morning. And so it's, it's really kind of a, an issue. So a friend will say, I love you. I'm always going to love you. But you stink. You need a bath. You need clean clothes. And you ain't getting up in my truck smelling and looking like that. Now, I will wait on you, but go clean up. That's a friend. If you're wanting them to go, watch this, because you know they're going to pay. And they go, now, listen, I probably need a shower. Oh, you look fine. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Your money's still green. Let them have a problem with it. They ain't got to wait on you. Let's go. You look great. You tell them what they want to hear because you're trying to use them for your own selfish gain. Now, take all your relationships and put them in those two funnels and tell me which ones love you. There's some people that think that they're God's gift to music. And they think that they can croon with the best of them. They think they can sing, they can rap, they can do, whoa, man, I just feel glory. When I, you might feel glory. Everybody else is trying to keep their ears from bleeding. So when you got a friend that's trying to grab the microphone and sing the glory down, you might want to take them down before their glory come down. Because a friend will tell the, thank you for the two and a half of you that responded, got to tell the truth. Somehow or another, we think we're doing God's bidding by lying to people to help them stay in a condition that they need Jesus to get them out of. And somehow we think we're being a, a blessing of the Lord by lying. Oh, you just fine. you just fine. Oh, you only smoking 50 joints a week? Oh, that's down from 50. What are you doing? Fine. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? I just offend another quarter of the church. It's okay. <laughs> Tell people. The truth. Now watch this. Tell them the truth because it benefits them, and tell them the truth because you love them, not because you go, ha, oh, they finally did it. Now I can really tell them the truth. I'm going to tell them. Don't have that attitude. Tell it in love. Man, I just, I just don't want people to be treating you bad, and I don't want the line to split like Moses parted the sea when you show up at the restaurant. I just, I just need you to bathe, man. just need you to bathe because I'm loving you. I just don't want to be near you right now. I'm just loving you. Tell them the truth. He ain't never going to want to sit on front row again. I'm going to tell you that. Guys, there's a difference between solitude and loneliness. Solitude is intentional in order to get your heart right. Loneliness is that your heart is so bent and so twisted and so infirm that you can't find a place that you feel okay to be with other people. Solitude brings healing. Loneliness is a slow, slow burn, destructive force. There are some people sitting in this room right now, and you don't even have to be prophetic to call them out. But there's some people sitting in this room right now that are so lonely, and they don't know how to express it without seeming expressive explicitly needy. That's why coming to church is a phenomenal thing. Because more times than not, you're going to get touched. Somebody you don't even know, hey, now I just, just want to say it's good to see you. That may seem like nothing to you and me. But for somebody who's lonely, every pat felt like cold, fresh water. Yeah. 
There's some people that they're living a life where they feel like they're invisible. And when you're just not running by, oh, good to see you, good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Just good to see you, good to see you. As long as you're not doing that, if you're looking them square in the face, hey, I'm Joel, what's your name? And you're looking them square in the eyes. What's your name? Huh? Linda. Linda, regardless of how embarrassed she might be from you talking to her right now, Linda knows because I saw her in her eyes and I had a small conversation. She's been seen. You know how many people come to church and leave even more lonely and more depressed because they weren't seen? This is why a lot of people stop coming to church, not just for this being seen, but because they came to church and on the inside it and they walked out thinking that God didn't even see them. That's why when you pat, look in the eyes, embrace somebody and hug them, you are Jesus with skin on it. So that when they leave, they know Jesus patted me, hugged me, saw me, talked to me, loved on me, encouraged me. That's our job. You say, well, that's good on a normal thing, but you know, what if I had a bad day? Jesus had a bad day. Have you ever heard of the Garden of Gethsemane? Even on bad days, you can have joy. Guys, we are Jesus in the earth. That's not sacrilege. I'm skipping. <laughs> How many of you still go to McDonald's? Y'all need to get right with Jesus for starters. <laughs> I'm joking, sort of. So I have always loved the Big Mac. Huh? How many can still see the uh, still sing the song, the Big Mac song? Huh? So, Big Macs had gotten expensive. I mean, you think you think you think you buying a steak for what you're going and getting? Where's the beef? You know what I mean? And so, some people got a little wiser. They decided, listen, I want a Big Mac for a less than Big Mac price. So there's this new trend where people are going through the drive-through and saying, yes. I would like a McDouble, two patties, but dress it as a Big Mac. Come on. And they're saying like they're, they're saving like a little over two dollars, and it tastes like a Big Mac. Why? Because you still got the bread, the meat, and it's dressed with the sauce and the lettuce and all the all the stuff. The Big Mac, the pickles, right? So you got you basically got a Big Mac. For a couple dollars less. See, some of y'all thinking, you need to get done with this, Pastor, because I'm I'm hitting the drive. <laughs> so here, here's the problem. Everybody wants something at a discount, including relationships. So they want you to spend the eight dollars on them, but they want what you got for four dollars. So we're in relationship. It is. It's just not equitable. It's lopsided. How many's ever been on a teeter totter? How many been on a teeter totter with somebody bigger than you? <laughs> huh? You can It's hard to teeter totter with somebody bigger than you, right? It's hard to have a relationship with somebody who's investing more or less than you. Yes, I'm going to say that one. So, Dad and I were pallbearers in a funeral. And this lady in life was not small. And in death, she was not light. And Dad and I have this short-statured guy between us. So I'm on the front, guy behind me, 
and then dad. And we have to carry this for about 100 yards. It's 110 degrees outside. Palms get sweaty. Physical, physical exertion gets difficult. And the casket is slipping through my hands. So I'm double-handing it. And I called the guy behind me. I called him by name. Pick up your part. <laughs> and he's walking around going, look, guys, I got this. This ain't no big deal. Look, 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 how I can handle this. We never walked so fast to get that casket to the hole. <laughs> huh? Why? Because somebody wasn't carrying their weight. Oh. See, you're wondering why certain relationships tax you and wear you out, and you didn't have but a 30-minute conversation. You go dragging yourself back in the house, and your wife goes, what's wrong with you? I don't even know. All I knew is I got to lay down. Why? Because you've been carrying not just yours but theirs. It's not an equitable relationship. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm trying to say today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Here's the mark of a true friend. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 57, as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. That's Goliath. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. Chapter 18. Verse 1, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Here's the mark. And he, being David, loved him, being Jonathan, as himself. What does the Bible say? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So watch this. To the degree that that's happening, true friendship is developing. To the degree that you're loving other people as you love yourself, a real relationship is happening. You cannot pursue Jesus and him run from you. <laughs> to the degree you come to Jesus, he's two to one coming to you. You catch what I'm saying? So when you say, Lord, I need you, he's closer than the breath that you use to bring the words out. It's like he's waiting just, it's kind of like you being on the mat, you know, and you're, you're playing tag team wrestling. And he's just waiting. You're on the floor getting a sense knocked out of you. And Jesus is just sitting there waiting, tag me. And all we got to do is say, Jesus, boom, he's in. And yet we come and we'll sit in meetings like this, insulated and isolated, and then complain, he didn't touch me, he didn't heal me, he didn't, he didn't help me, he didn't. You have not because you ask not. You say, well, I was here. <laughs> Try going to a restaurant, sitting with a menu, never order, and then complain you didn't get your food. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loveth at all times. I'm about to tie a bow in this. I can love Chris for who he is and still hate what Chris does. Yeah. 
And for me to tell him, I don't like the fact you ride your motorcycle 150 miles an hour. I don't like the fact you only tip 50 cents. I don't like the fact you're still wearing Old Spice. This is 2024. (laughs) There's a lot of things that I can disagree with him about. None of them should be relationship dissolving. But there is a common mindset that says, if you're my friend, then you got to approve everything I do. If I'm your friend, I'm very necessarily not going to approve everything you do. Because if I'm a friend, I'm going to tell you what's up. You follow me? So... We need to draw a line of distinction that I can love him and hate what he does. He could have killed somebody and served time in prison for it. And just because I was friends with him at the time does not mean I condone what he did. I'm still going to love him. He's still a soul. He's still a spirit. He's still my brother. You just did some dumb, dumb stuff. Where are the relationships where we can actually tell our friends the truth and they embrace us for it instead of saying, we're done. You ain't my brother no more. Where are those? And because we're so used to getting cut off if we say something that people don't like, we expect that God's going to cut us off if we say or do something he don't like. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. Where's the real relationship? The second part of that verse says, and a brother is born for adversity. You, you want to know, <laughs> you know what that means? A brother is born for your day of problems. Don't be just trying to have friends when everything's good. As long as you got money flowing, you got all kinds of friends. Another round, another, you know, wreck the balls again. Let's, let's, let's take another vacation. Hey, you want that car? <laughs> I got plenty. When the money runs out, you don't have that friend no more. Why? Because they were never your friend. But a brother is born for when you have problems. Watch this. When he's going to prison for doing something wrong, I'm in his life for such a time as this. Y'all ain't hearing anything. I, I'm sorry, is this, is this a little bit more real and raw to what you wanted? We, it's like we want to come, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you posted that. I can't believe you, I can't believe you, we're done. Where's the relationship in that? If we, if we did a line item of belief systems, there's not going to be anybody got the same exact, me and my wife would not be exact. But you know what? What we agree on far outweighs what we disagree on. That's how we can stay married. Some of y'all looking, well, I was going to be their friend, but then they posted this about Biden, or they posted this about Trump, or they posted this about. Listen, what you going to do when I say, where you want to go eat? And you say, well, I want swaddlies. And I say, well, I, I want rib crib. Oh, it's over now. Proverbs 29, verse 5, whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for their feet. If all you're getting is flattery, people will will not tell you the truth about anything. Oh, that shirt is fine. Oh, yeah, you smell great. Oh, no, you look wonderful. Oh, yeah, everything's great. It don't matter that you did that, said that, went there, did that. No, everything's fine. Flattery is they're setting a trap for you. Some of you are going to have to learn this phrase. We're just going to have to agree to disagree. Next. The Bible says in uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now, I heard two of you, RJ was one of them, said if you're going to have a real relationship with somebody, it needs to be somebody that loves Jesus. Okay? I've said this before. But there's some new, new ears in the room. If you say you want to have a relationship with me, but you don't like my wife, we're done. Because she and I are a package. You get a twofer. Right? So if, you, if it's that way with my wife, and it is, 
And then somebody says, listen, I like you, but I don't want you talking about that Jesus stuff and this God stuff is a bunch of malarkey and there ain't no such thing as heaven and hell and you you just smoking some crazy weed. And, and I, you know, you, you hear anything I'm saying? So if, if I'm going to divide a divorce relationship over the fact that you're trying to divide me from my wife, imagine what's going to happen when you try to divide me from my God. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? And you say, well, well, how do you witness the people? Listen. <laughs> Come here, Chris. Link my arm. This is walking together. Notice we're going the same speed, the same direction. We're in harmony. But if I don't know him and I'm passing by and our paths are crossing, man, I just want to share Jesus with you. Well, I don't want none of your Jesus. Well, you have a blessed day anyway. I'm going to pray for you. Watch. I'm not yoked with him. So I can witness all day long. I'm not saying ignore them. I'm saying don't get in covenant relationship and hook up with somebody who's going to take your direction that's away from your family, away from God, and away from what he's called you to do. Thank you. So now I'm going to answer the question. Why can't we be friends? Why can't I'm going to answer that. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul says, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about the unbelievers who indulge, indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Can you imagine saying, listen, you can hang out with sinners as long as they don't sin. Verse 11, he said, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer and yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with them. So I can witness to people all day long who that is their lifestyle because they don't know God. But if you're wearing the Christian T-shirt and let's pray and glory, hallelujah, and Hyundai, Shundai, untie my bow tie, and you're all this stuff, and yet you're living like the one who doesn't know God, I'm walking away. I won't eat McDonald's with you. I won't eat Qdoba with you. I won't share a bottle of water with you. Why? Because you're lying on God. That's like you trying to have a, a relationship with me and, and fellowship with me and tell me how my wife is, 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 a, is, is a belligerent and, and messing people up and lying to them and, and cheating them out of all kinds of stuff. And you're, just, you're lying on I know her. Why? Because I know her character because we live together. We're one. She can't do junk without me knowing it because I would feel it. So you're telling me, oh, well, I love God too, but it's okay that we do this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. Love you, but I'm going to love you over there. You follow me? I saw a post yesterday. It says, and I quote, A smart person will change their view if new information contradicts their belief. An indoctrinated person lacks this ability. They're conditioned to dismiss facts. I want to tell you something. I pray prayers that are contrary to facts every day of my life. When I'm decreeing healing over somebody who's got a death sentence from the doctor, I am nullifying the facts. It is faith over facts. I will pray faith over facts every day of my existence. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's not saying that you have to be blind, deaf, and dumb to facts. Fine. That's part of the equation. But I'm never going to let a fact overwhelm the truth. Truth transcends facts. Facts do not transcend truth. That's why I can pray for miracles and watch them happen because the fact is they're jacked up, messed up from the floor up, but when God gets on the scene, bam, miracles happen. That's why we have miracles because faith trumps facts. How many of you in this room have ever desired the Lord to provide you friends been asking God, Lord, I need some relationships in my life. But yet at the same time, you've not been willing to be the kind of friend you're asking God to bring you. 
Do you believe that you're being the kind of friend that you desire, but yet you're not reciprocating it? Could it be that you're right in your own eyes, but not in the eyes of everybody else? I'm going to tell you something. If you're right in your own eyes, and that's contrary to what everybody else is telling you, the chances are high that you're wrong. Could it be that you've been unwilling to hear hard truths and make positive changes for you as well as others? Could it be that the kind of friend that you're desiring from others or to be to others is not what God desires for you? I'm going to read this scripture, and then I'm going to sign off the video, and then I'm going to pray for those that want prayer. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 18. How many would just be honest in this room and say that you've demonstrated or lived in such a way to show anger, resentment, unforgiveness, and disapproval towards God because things appear like they're going wrong in your life? If he was any kind of God, I wouldn't have to be dealing with this relationship. I wouldn't be dealing with that bill. I wouldn't have this debt. I wouldn't have this beat-up old car. If God was any kind of God, my, my kids would be obedient. My, I'd have promotions. And Come on. Jeremiah 15, verse 18. Jeremiah's crying out, Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? He's talking to the Lord. You, O oh Lord, are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. Can you imagine saying to God, you've deceived me. You've told me that you'd be this refreshing water that would cleanse my soul and end my thirst. You lied. That's what Jeremiah is saying. Listen to God's response. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people and a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they won't overcome you, for I am with you to rescue you and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and deliver you from the grasp of the cruel. You talk about a merciful God who just didn't go and strike him dead. God says, listen, there's another, there's another translation that says, something along the lines of, if you will get rid of this mistaken tone of distrust, then I'll heal you. I believe we got some people in this room that have had a, a tone that says, God, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. You said you're going to fix this. You said you're going to heal me. You said you're going to set me free. You said it wasn't going to be like this, blah, 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 blah. Well, listen, if you're doing the opposite of what God told you to do, you're going to get the opposite of what God told you you could have. Blessings come from obedience, not from disobedience. So if you're here today and you still find yourself bent at God, things didn't work the way you thought they should. You feel like God forgot you, abandoned you, violated his own word when he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I think we know enough from Scripture that we know that can't be true. But it doesn't mean that sometimes our feelings don't lie to us. You ever ask your mate, do you really love me? Do you really love me? You sure about that? Sometimes we do it in jest just to get a response because sometimes our flesh lies to us and says, yeah, they're done. Come on. So sometimes our mistaken tone of distrust is blatant because we're mad at God but sometimes it's because we just want to know he's still there. But either way, you can't come to God with mistrust and distrust and expect him to bless you. You're going to have to get rid of it. You can't have mistrust and distrust in your 
earthly relationships, and it lasts. For those of you that have caught any portion of this, this message, we celebrate the fact that you did. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're looking for a church home, we're certainly looking to adopt some more people and grow the family of God. We'd love to see you here on South Oklahoma City, 2632 Southwest 39th. We meet Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. Please check our calendar and our, our app to find out what's going on as far as men's ministry, youth, children, and, and ladies. We'd love to have you be a part of all of that. So until our next appointed time, God bless you and have an incredible day.